good evening everyone are you able to hear me vishal is my voice audible to you vishal shweta sunil yes sir yes, your audio voice is audible great uh, okay i'm actually avoiding to use my video today because i'm sitting in a car somewhere else okay so um, i'll share the screen so you guys can see it because if i open my video i don't think there will be a lot of blur uh, in the image so it doesn't help so but uh, yes i uh, like as usually do i guess i can expect you guys to have your uh, you know uh, camera open okay because uh, i think opening my camera will not do any good today Sure, but uh, wouldn't that also uh, if our videos are also running wouldn't that uh... the thing is i'm sitting in a car and there's lot of background light so okay okay so network it. is fine yeah, yeah network is all right i'm in hyderabad so network should be all right sure i didn't manage to reach home in time so just sitting in the vehicle and doing it if you want i can actually show you so this is how my background looks like so <laughs> won't be any good i don't know if i can change anything itself you spotlight okay right okay good um so last class i think we were talking about the unit 10 right growth uh, and development topics that we started in the last class so today we are going to continue with that aspect okay and uh, i also posted material for you to read from the group okay i'll show them uh, briefly i think one of them is bit extensive we have to pick and choose and the other two i think i was showing you in the class i want you to have in addition to what you have written in the in the form of running notes i want you to have these for additional reading purpose so in case if you want to make some sentences or if you missed something so these uh, documents would help you okay with with that so that is why i gave you those for reading reading components okay so what did i give you let me open them briefly and help you first of all so growth and development and growth stages uh, stand for an allen and growth factors i can show them to you briefly so some of them i think you have to selectively read there so then both stages Stain and grow. Yes. Oh, let me share the screen with you to tell you what we are looking for in that. So, sharing my screen. Um, so, this is something I found. Uh, very useful to us because it fits very well into the syllabus that we have but this i have not made this okay this is as originally as it is this is from department of anthropology vidya sagar university from west bengal okay concept of human physical growth and development i found it covers lot of aspects that we need for uh, the upsc syllabus okay that is why i kept as it is i have not made any changes to it so basically what you learn here i think they have provided introduction to what does it mean by growth and the concept of development is given here okay so give it a brief read and selected things like what watson lorry's definition for growth and those components we discussed in the class and coma's definitions harlock definitions i picked up them okay from this source and uh, they also briefly talked about the concept of maturation okay so maturity is attaining the functional aspect of it in a way we discuss it in similarity with the development concept here so functional attainment basically that is what they briefly discussed here and few aspects of growth linear or distance growth we talked about these uh, some principles of growth so which components actually grow first so those those things are briefly discussed here okay and then stages of growth we talked about prenatal period we talked about postnatal infancy childhood adolescence the points i have given you in addition to that if you want bit of reading go through this physiological changes that happen in the process maturity also they briefly talked about which we didn't put too much of focus on to but we kind of discuss them like here they talked about maturity as such how skeletal system uh, attains maturity over a period of time how our teeth attains maturity over a period of time also the shape age so they talked about these three components 
So we we actually focused on going briefly in other terms of how we can recognize the certain stages of life using teeth because normally childhood defined is defined based on that. Okay, they, they talked a bit more about these concepts here. And senescence, we have not talked about yet. I'm going to discuss today about the concept of senescence. You'll understand it later. Also based on our discussion. And I've provided some uh, definitions from this as well. So theories of aging, uh, very briefly, they mentioned it here. We're going to discuss a bit in detail on this. And uh, so I think those are the important ones I'm focusing on. We don't need these curves. They're not uh, relevant to us. Okay, growth charts, we're going to briefly talk about this as part of the nutritional anthropology in the unit 12. And factors affecting growth and development, you can definitely refer to this part. Uh, genetic factor, environmental factor, biochemical factors or endocrine regulation is nothing but the biochemical factor and nutritional factors. Okay, cultural, socio-economic, I think other things that we are going to discuss today. Okay, right. In addition to that, I've also posted these things. I think I was showing you some of these in the class already. Control of growth and development, endocrine glands, so various factors. This is additional reading, biological anthropology book by Stain and Rowe. Briefly discussed about role of hormones, so endocrine glands or biochemical components here. I think I showed you this in the last class, testosterone, estrogen, and effects of nutritional deficiency diseases. So part of epidemiological anthropology, nutrition deficiency diseases that we talked about. Okay, and uh, that is indicating that uh, these nutritional components are essential for our growth. So when we don't have them, when we don't get them in enough enough quantities, so this is what happens. It results in the diseases that we discussed in the class for epidemiological anthropology. So quashi archer, marasmus, those type of diseases they discuss. So basically, they put together the the last part we discussed in epidemiological anthropology and this part. But I've already discussed briefly with you how nutrition is important macronutrients, micronutrients, those components we have to put together. Okay, and uh, similarly, if you want to read a bit on the biological anthropological perspective on uh, various stages of uh, growth. So here, uh, they talked about human childbirth process. I think I've shown you an image from this. Remember this process, how it is different between humans and chimpanzees, between animals and we briefly talked about. Okay, and then uh, patterns of human growth. Just so they briefly talked about the concept of uh, starting from the how childbirth takes place and the brief components of how with age are you know how different parts of the body attain various growth aspects like in age in years, reproductive general brain and head. So you see that reproductive. I think I've shown this image to you or similar chart to you. The reproductive age normally develops after about certain age after 13, 14 years. Brain development happens already at the age of six to seven years. So maximum uh, development of the brain happens early enough and reproductive happens later. So these type of graphs are useful to you. You can use them in the exam. And stages of human growth as an alternate to what we have shown before, prenatal and gestational stage. Few other additional points are given here. Slightly different way of looking at the growth stages, but you already have an idea about what should come under each of them. So this shouldn't be too difficult for you. So growth stages, they also compared the other primates. As you see it here, prenatal period and infancy, they compared with lemur, macaques, gibbon, chimpanzees. So brief idea, this is comparative analysis they have done. We have not seen these type of questions in the exam. This out of curiosity, if you are interested for a comparative analysis like that, have a look at this. Okay, have a look at these components of how different stages actually change between primates, other primates and humans. Okay, what else I think uh, one important thing I found it useful to you uh, here is uh, some of the pollutants that cause a the problem. They actually talked about one of the disease when people are actually are exposed to alcohol in the early ages of life, you know, they develop certain diseases. Okay, they briefly talked about this concept here. Fetal alcoholic syndrome they discussed here as an example. If you want, you can pick up that example from this. Okay, no way there was. Adults and growth, they talked about populations here. Um, okay, Russian babies with us. Yes, FAS. Fetal alcoholic syndrome, they call. Yes, they introduce it here. Fetal alcohol syndrome. So conditions seen in children that results from excessive drinking of alcohol by the mother during pregnancy. Okay, so how certain 
components environmental factors in growth right we talked about uh, smoking as well as alcohol you can give an example of this disease fetal alcohol syndrome you can pick that from here mention about that okay in the factors especially when we discuss about the alcohol okay right so they have also given some examples of comparison here surveys in russia 13% of definitely have certain phenotypes consistent with this syndrome okay uh, and because russia is one place where we have highest amounts of alcohol consumptions in the world so they have done started some studies there and which indicated the effect of alcohol on the child's growth okay right so otherwise we talked about these components already growth spurts infancy juvenile adolescence and adulthood okay this is for the growth stages that you can read second thing uh, if at all uh, i'm not sure you probably heard about this the secular trend in growth you can also notice that there is a secular trend in growth meaning you notice that over a period of time if you notice in this graph age in years we are looking into girls here and age in years on the right hand side we are looking into boys and how height is actually changing i think there is an increasing trend towards increase in height so overall height can be seen as a component that is actually increasing over a period of time okay they they did an old study 1883 1938 1968 as you see the the curvature of the graph is decreasing meaning the mean height in girls as well as boys is increasing over centuries so this concept is known as secular trend in growth okay so by using the data collected by uh, the scientists called oxologists i'm not sure if you heard about oxologists are the scientists who read or who study the growth and development aspects so these are called oxologists so study of growth and development is oxology and those who study this is are called oxologists so they observed striking trend in the growth we don't know in case if they decide to give observations like this in the exam very much possible just be familiar about it so in the exam if it happens to come you can you can answer this these type of questions concept is simple so we are seeing increase in the height over a period of time who identified it oxologists who are oxologists are the scientists who study growth and development aspects okay what did they notice by using the data collected beginning at the 18th century these oxologists have demonstrated that industrialized countries so those developed countries in these countries children have been growing larger and maturing more rapidly with each decade starting in the late 19th century in europe and north america that is what they are talking about and also this is happening as the countries are growing very much like how ncds or non communicable diseases are showing up in a similar manner there is an increasing trend in uh, maturity and uh, and also rapid concept related to the both size increase in size as well as in the maturity rate of maturity both are increasing okay that is what they talked about they have given a brief comparison of how uh, the secular trend started in japan after world war 2 and also other parts of the world you can see europe north america children at 5 to 7 years of age averaged an increase in stature of 1 to 2 cm increase per decade every decade they are growing by 1 to 2 cm higher than usual so this is this is what is referred to as secular trend in growth what is the reason behind it lot of factors so better nutrition seen as one one reason here more calories and more protein diet we have better insight into what do we require for our body okay so definitely better nutrition and better understanding about growth requirements is helping here and also affordability and better environment better health in developed countries compared to the under developed countries or developing countries so these seems to be the reason and this concept is called secular trend in growth which is briefly discussed here described here okay right this is what uh, you can expect from these material that i have sent you okay uh, what next we are going to discuss about the remaining growth factors what are the remaining growth factors so i think we finished talking about the environmental nutritional correct and the biochemical aspects we discussed about i think we are left with the uh, mostly the socio economic factors and cultural factors correct so what do you think uh, is there is there any impact of socio economic condition Social economic condition, cultural condition, or cultural environment on growth. What do you think? 
do you think of any relationship between socio economic status and growth and culture and and growth any ideas for you to begin with so poor socio economic leads to malnutrition and correct straight less forward, growth good. yeah poor uh, economic condition so definitely socio economic status as a direct impact so poor economic condition can impact the nutritional aspect of the growth correct absolutely right anything else you can think of in in from culture we can mm. uh, talk about say uh, in one of the class we discussed uh, in india uh, mm -hmm. the ve vegetarians right. usually lack uh, take less amount of protein correct. and this being a cultural aspect uh, right also plays so a religious role. beliefs of vegetarianism Okay, can also impact the way uh, the growth is affected. Absolutely right. Right. So these points are not too difficult to understand. We need to know in the right context. Okay, I've collected a few points and I'm going to show you them. Uh, one I've actually put as part of the handout like this. So we'll start with the uh, social economic factors first. So absolutely right. I think uh, definitely affordability to have proper nutrition can make the difference. So, socio-economic influence on human growth is very well known. So, children who are from different socio-economic levels differ in average body size. So, looks like people who are socio-economically or economically weaker sections tend to have. This is an average concept. We cannot generalize this. Okay, differ in average body size. Okay, and we're talking about mostly the extreme conditions. Those who are really poor that who could not afford to have proper nutrition versus those who could have the choice of foods that they want and healthy choices they can make. But it doesn't mean that if you have good amount of money, you would always make healthy choices, right? That is a different aspect here. The aspect that we are looking at, would you be able to afford to have the proper diet? Okay, do you have that amount of money? So socioeconomic status has definitely the correlation with the health status of a family and the growth and development conditions of the children in a given family. Not only children, true with the even pregnant mothers, right? So definitely the nutrition component can be seen as a major impacted area from socioeconomic status. So all of aspects like habits of having regular meals, regular sleep, exercise, general organization that distinguish from good home, bad home, all these components can make a difference and socioeconomic status can in impact this. Right, uh, whether they eat meals regularly or not, whether they sleep in you know, a good environment or not, whether they exercise or not. So these aspects definitely can be impacted by the social economic condition. So to keep it, to make it a bit simpler for you to understand these components, I'll show you that, you know, the key aspects that you need to discuss as part of social economic status are these. What are they? So I just mentioned to you that body size is positively related to the social economic status. So uh, through nutrition, better socioeconomic status, better health, better growth and development because it in, in influences the nutrition component. Correct? This is one point we discussed so far. So here, socioeconomic status means we are talking about the income, how much do they earn, how much they can actually spend towards the food. What else can matter which is connected to socioeconomic status? Here, socioeconomic status may not be directly impacting it, may be impacting indirectly. So here, like education, people who could afford to have good education because education providers knowledge are supposed to provide us knowledge about good health and food. So it doesn't mean that all well-educated people eat right amount of food or right nutritious diet. I don't think we agree with that, right? So we may not. But uh, education should, should actually provide us knowledge about healthy choices of life for food. So education... Another component you can talk about is time. So time to cook the food or time to actually purchase the good quality materials. I think uh, the urbanized life has changed quite a bit now. In olden days, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, having uh, enough money to purchase good food was, was a problem in the past because good food was always available in the rural areas. There was no problem at all. 
it was found in nature but now it is because of urbanization what happened you need two aspects you need to you need time to go and find the right stuff select the right stuff if you don't have time what do we do quickly we go to you uh, know for example uh, uh, what do we have mcdonald or some some of those things are eat pizza or stuff stuff that when we don't have time we cannot make time so food selection and preparation time both are connected to time and socio economic status indirectly connected to it daily labor for example they would actually spend most of the time working they will not have time to go and find the right choices and even if they want to find in urban areas it is costly in urbanized places it is costly availability access to the stores with healthy choices and affordability becomes a problem so you can talk about these aspects a simple concept how do their income education time availability would impact the growth and development you can connect through these four points to socio economic status okay these are general this is a general idea if you get this i'm going to provide you a bit more observations on this but this is a very general picture of how socio economic status can impact the growth okay let me show you few pointers on this few observations on this okay so what are the observations so i think one observation that we already kind of made it a larger family with limited income the children do not get proper nutrition so size of the family may also matter you will see that in fertility and fecundity chapter that is unit 11 that always there is a correlation between socio economic status inverse relationship between socio economic status and children so normally uh, people who are uh, you know Uh, living in a moderate or a weaker socio economic conditions tend to have more children we'll discuss why, why why what is the reason behind it but i think you agree with me that large families tend to be part of the low socio economic groups many factors lack of education lack of understanding lack of sometimes you know uh, need calculations okay many factors are there but in if they are socio socio economically weak and they have more children would they be able to afford to feed the children they won't be so this is one problem large family plus low socio economic status so together would result in poor nutrition or malnutrition in children okay so simply large family plus low socio economic condition equal to malnutrition okay next children in families who experience persistent financial hardships so people who experience financial problems and poverty have significantly impaired cognitive abilities so studies have shown this was an old study from 1990s which it, it has it has shown that people who struggle for money who are in poverty their cognitive abilities are also impacted so this is aspect of development right we talked about development is attaining maturity so what happens there so cognitive ability is are impacted when they are in poverty when they are in poverty okay right these type of uh, observations you can write here i have put these discussions in the handout talked about few aspects that you can write here so nutrition we already discussed about 
connected to socio economic factor size of the family exerts an indirect influence on the rate of the growth i, I talked to you about okay so number of children so already talked about children in larger families have shown to be usually smaller and lighter than children in small families okay so these components you can write as part of the socio economic influence and also you can add those components i mentioned to you like in with respect to the time education you can also mention them okay few points like this and couple of observations okay next we'll we'll talk about cultural factors what type of role does cultural factors have let's see so i'm going to give you a few ideas here so culture definitely seems to play an important role in influencing the growth and development aspects and even what is normal the definition of growth and development also varies from culture to culture what is considered normal development in one culture may not be true some cultures i think having little a little bit of you know weight on the body is considered to be all right okay asian cultures we tend to see it if you see european cultures i think even european cultures are not like that but uh, american cultures for example so calculating calories with the concept of urbanization had come into the existence so they became too calculative okay multiple factors are there behind it but definitely what i am trying to tell you is culturally what is accepted to be normal may differ from culture to culture so your expectations related to growth and development are also different being chubby being having little bit of fat and weight is considered to be normal in cultures which is not uh, accepted in other cultures so starting from the expectation itself i think culture may influence the concept of growth and development but understanding the role of culture is more recent how culture is impacting our growth and development is more recent so still not much is known about it so we don't have a clear picture about role of culture but definitely culture plays an important role and we are we lately realize this component so we don't have too much of data on that but definitely have couple of points for you to make a note of so what are they okay i will first show you i think few key points i have written here uh, look at how culture can influence how certain perceptions in a culture can influence one across different cultures children develop in quite different ways the way we handle children the way we treat children culturally varies from culture to culture okay one aspect is the education and health components so education are uh, we already talked about with respect to socio economic conditions proper education can define proper health and proper health can define the proper growth correct so for example there are few uh, i think some peculiar observations i would like to tell you here which you might have not realized or you cannot put into the context of this okay understand this this is not too difficult but you have to know this okay so let me explain you so here they are talking about how children are treated differently like infants in middle class communities in the us united states are often ex expected to sleep alone by the time they are only a few months old indeed i remember uh, actually even the doctors recommend us to have the baby to sleep separately from you this is a common practice there actually they would come and visit you when i had uh, our first baby in canada they came to our place to check where baby is sleeping it is not allowed to have the baby with you baby has to be put separately in a in a more you know comfortable area comfort in the sense nothing that actually can cover up their mouth because many children i think uh, reported to die from these type of problems so they don't recommend any sorts of pillows or anything like that flat place okay but something like a bassinet or things like that but they have to be put separately from the parents this is a requirement in some countries so nurses visit your homes they have to make sure that children are not sleeping with you so in some countries actually the children are kept away from the parents 
okay while other other countries like you know in asian countries in india i think it is it is almost seen as a an acceptable thing if you have the child away from you okay we cannot even imagine that happening also in mayan children typically share their mothers bed through their toddler years few cultures also have children always stay with them i think asians are good examples you can say in asian countries in india for example children even till toddler years they are with parents they sleep with parents correct so what is the connection to growth and development here so few aspects you can see western societies like usa can be considered as age segregated societies with children spending much of their time away from the activities of adults they don't even prefer to spend time with what adults do I have observed it many times okay so what are they losing here because of this segregation it removes children from that opportunity to observe and learn from elders so they are taken away from the elders so that the observation point is missing and you can clearly see the difference you talk to an youngster a teenager from usa or uk or in our other countries similar countries and in india the way they share the responsibilities the way they look at the family is very very different you actually single them out from the family they they are more self centered they think about their lives they think about their career they think about their future and without having the picture of parents with them that is how parents have trained them but what is the problem here one loneliness one aspect of is lack of guidance second aspect is not being able to observe the parents right this can impact their developmental concept so attaining the maturity may be affected here <coughs> are you able to follow this context sir i didn't get why they are separating them in the culture the separation is basically the reason behind it is multiple one is independence they want the children to be independent in the early stages when i was telling you why children are kept away because one if uh, elderly people sleep with them they tend to choke children tend to choke they may not get enough air okay and also the coverings that we use like bed sheets and those we use may cover up their face because children especially infants don't have that control right they may cover up their face with a bed sheet for example and they they die because of that because of those incidents government recommends them not to have not to have them next to the parents and not to have any covers you know that can cover their face okay that is why originally they start putting them separately then in individuality basically later later point of time parents want more pri privacy parents want more private time so they want their children to be away from them that continues in later stages as well they definitely become more independent there is no doubt but at the same time they are missing the opportunity to observe their parents closely to learn and which can positively influence their development so this is cultural behavior okay next so do we have any uh, say any kind of information uh, this practice when when it has started any idea on that i think this looks more like the more modern trend okay this to me from my own observation it looks to me uh, that it's more modern modernized because even the but uh, some traditional families in countries like usa and canada as well they follow the still 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 same old strategy but mostly the migrants follow the strategy and the majority of the people who live in those countries who are natives don't have that strategy there so i have to check whether there are any studies related to that uh, uh, like in in with respect to the timeline when it also uh, regarding the last point where they can <laughs> learn from elders mm -hmm. so um, so if it's a good behavior <laughs> i think we can look at this as a Uh, right. uh, negative thing, but uh, of lately, many right. parents have been fighting and uh, correct. So uh, you... Yes, I think I think yes, you are absolutely right. I think the the learning component has changed over a period of time, but the picture that we get here is the uh, more the positive side of the picture, like uh, various aspects. I think violence and those components in a family uh, would have a negative influence on them. okay but uh, the thing is there are many aspects like how do you run the family day to day basis how do you plan your spendings right how do you organize various events at home how do you actually talk to each other in the family 
those aspects uh, have to be learned from someone because it's like yeah, they are they, that is they're showing your future so those aspects you talked about but in in a very specific situation where there is more family violence yes this is going to have a negative impact on them i think if you see in the evolutionary perspective like how primates teach their children like chimpanzees for example teach their children how to hunt ants for example okay those components that are actually run in families they are taught by their parents we are talking about those aspects here but absolutely you are right so in certain conditions where there is more violence in the family they can negatively influence you can also add that as a cultural aspect so few cultures it is acceptable to actually have a fight acceptable to you know gender violation happens in some areas where you know it is all right to uh, show that uh, do dominance in the family which also runs runs in the families so both positive and negative aspects run in the family this is how culture is actually inherited in a way so both aspects are there but here we are looking into the positive aspect of what they are missing out okay All right next uh, joint family versus nuclear family so culturally some families i think it is acceptable i think it is actually expected to live in joint families whereas with the urbanization whereas within the developed countries you see more of nuclear families becoming a common theme so this can also have an influence this can also have an influence on the growth and development there are multiple dimensions you can take here okay one aspect is joint family you will have more family support nuclear family let's say both father and mother are working so there won't be much care given to the child so that may have a negative influence on them so one aspect here is joint families are advantageous where grandparents because even the age wise that is how i think fertility concept will discuss about it the grandparents are actually don't have they don't they are not engaged they are probably retired from work they don't have small children to take care of then what they can do they can take care of the grandchildren so in uh, joint families so children get more care more support in that sense whereas nuclear families would struggle to do that so there can be a negative impact on children in nuclear families and a positive impact to joint families right so this is acceptable that we can actually see it in india the the trend that stress, traditionally that we have joint families more nuclear families we see today and you can clearly observe the difference between both of them when pay child grandparents take care of them versus when they are sent to you know uh, day cares and those things how they are okay next uh, education wise uh, united states us what do you notice in us like countries girls in public school often receive information about menstruation very early culture wise it is allowed actually expected to discuss with children about menstruation process and menstruation hygiene is very menstrual hygiene is very important so these concepts are discussed very early in the school it is part of their education but in countries like in india and other countries what happens developing countries like africa no such education exists so what happens what is a what is a relationship here when you are not taught them and when it is not acceptable to openly discuss or provide those resources so girls at that age tend to miss school more frequently studies show that in africa more adolescent girls actually miss school than boys that is because of lack of education related to menstrual hygiene so because of that education is affected okay so they are saying that indirectly education would in impact the growth and development aspects okay look at the cultural difference in what do we discuss and what do we don't discuss this aspect we talked about here excuse me the next component is gender inequality gender inequality how can that matter so more preference towards boys in some cultures okay would provide less freedom less education and restrict the opportunities that girls can have so starting from the nutrition i think uh, 
it is not surprise that if we hear that males are actually fed first then the girls right and usually even today it is a custom in many many families that so families um, female members of the families eat, eat later than the males so it it might not provide them enough opportunities in terms of proper food choices okay. and also they are not given much freedom exposure wise even education i think uh, socio economic condition and cultural aspects if you see together so in families many families i think sending a girl for education was not acceptable in some societies so they don't received good education even if they receive education they may receive elementary education higher education is actually not recommended for them for many reasons one reason is the socio economically if they are educated it is difficult to get a good uh, you know groom for them and they may ask for a more dowry for example in some places so these angles you can look into here so culturally the way we treat boys and girls are different that can also have an impact on growth and development aspects of boys and girls differently okay right similarly you can even talk about different religious beliefs different religious beliefs like vegetarianism yes i don't think being a vegetarian i think wouldn't impact the concept of growth and development but number of choices sometimes are less even in vegetarianism nowadays i think we are realizing that i think fat can cause more more damage to the heart condition especially in india where we have a higher uh, disease rate death rate because of heart problems practicing vegetarianism is not bad but the thing is provided that you actually get the balanced diet it is all right but strictly uh, based on the religion if you are sacrificing the proper nutritional requirements then it can cause problem you can also mention these type of examples like religious activities and which promote some religions promote vegetarianism okay this may also impact provided if they don't take proper care it may impact negatively the growth and development aspects we are not trying to conclude here that vegetarianism is not balanced diet or not not good for growth and development so we have to be careful here we are trying to tell the options may be less okay and uh, they if they satisfy the requirements even with the vegetarianism that is all right if not that can cause a problem the whole process begins with the cultural aspect cultural belief okay i mentioned that in the part of the handout gender discrimination low status women's low status uh, is root to the denial of their rights so less freedom poor mental and physical health can be seen uh, young girls receive less nutrition opportunities to play access early learning than young boys is something that is useful here exposure of young girls is also low they are not allowed to go out and play so much okay so early learning which is very important aspect for development is missing or can miss in a few cultures for girls okay right and also talked about the uh, menstrual hygiene here okay those components you can write uh, with respect to the cultural factors okay right so this are the various factors that influence the human growth and development okay next we'll move on to the various methods to study human growth so now we are going to cover methods to study human growth
okay right how do you study human growth what type of approaches we take here we are going to learn about few ways few methods that are used in studying growth okay what are they here we are going to talk about cross sectional method longitudinal method and cohort sequential studies and twin studies and twin studies so what is the difference okay cross sectional method longitudinal method so basically what are we trying to learn here we are trying to learn how do you actually understand various components of growth and development how do you study them what approaches are what methodologies we can use so one method is cross section another one is longitudinal and then i'll explain you about cohort and we already kind of discussed about the twin studies correct right? you can also make a mention that twin studies are used in understanding the like genetic components you want to know whether genetics or environment plays an important role in attaining normal growth okay or attaining better uh, you know improvement with respect to skeletal muscles or better improvement with respect to the uh, brain function for example you can study them with twins and non twins in comparison to see whether genetics plays a role or environment plays a role right that's something that we already discussed about but what about cross sectional longitudinal method and cohort se sequential method so look at this example and this nicely uh, describes the these two methods so cross sectional method refers to studying different groups compared at one time so cross sections you are actually studying different sections at a given point of time meaning let's say you want to study how does protein improve the growth aspects in children or you may be more specific protein vegetarian protein or a muscle protein or something like that if you are talking about how does it help so let's say if you are conducting a study by comparing a 20 year old 50 year old 80 year old or if for our question we may compare 2 year old 4 year old 6 year old 8 year old if you are comparing how let's say 50 grams of protein or 70 grams of protein 100 grams of protein is it sufficient for supporting the growth for 2 year old 4 year old 6 year old 8 year old that is called a cross sectional study that is called cross sectional study so at a given point of time you are studying different groups or different sections cross section cross section okay from this chart this chart actually nicely explains it in the cross section studies we actually discuss or look at one point in time and different samples you cover different samples here who are the samples the subjects are 2 year old 4 year old 6 year old 8 year old are the subjects you are studying at a given point single point you are observing all of them at one given point such a study is called a cross sectional study okay cross sectional study in the right side graph tell me what is cross sectional study year 2002 2004 2006 they are talking about three different years and year of birth 1994 1996 let's say eight year old six year old you are comparing at same time point in 2002 you checked how protein is actually supporting the growth in a six year old and eight year old this is a cross sectional study the one shown in the red arrows here is a cross sectional study how is it different excuse me so same thing if you actually perform a study like this you picked up the 6 year old in 2002 again you actually monitoring him monitoring him the next year or a year later after 2 years or after 4 years if you are observing the same person or a group of people all 6 year olds you collected 10 of them you are observing them how protein is affecting them into after 2 years after 2 after another 2 years so you are studying the impact of nutrition on them over a period of time instead of collecting or comparing them at a given point of time between different age groups you are following the same group over a period of time like this several points in a time 
sometimes it's same sample meaning same subject so same person or same group of people you are observing over a period of time okay so that study is called longitudinal study same group group at age 20 same group at age 50 same group at age 80 or group at 2 years group at 4 years group at 6 years do you see the difference here cross sectional if you pick up the example i mentioned 2 years 4 years 6 year old 8 year old children you studied at one point of time meaning different subjects you are studying but instead you can watch how a 2 year old by eating that some amount of protein would look after 4 years after another 2 years that is at the 4th year another plus 2 years that is at the 6th year 8th year like that if you are conducting the study or observing them it is called longitudinal it's a series same group it studied at different time points cross section is different group studied at one time point do you understand the difference between cross sectional study and longitudinal study here okay so there are two ways that you can study two common ways to study the impact of growth so what are the benefits of cross sectional studies and what are the benefits of longitudinal studies which is better do you see any problems in such studies which one do you think is better yes or no cross sectional cross section is better what is your reason behind that why do you think cross section is better different samples we can, we can study at a time okay so what does it tell you different from longitudinal study in case of longitudinal more time would be required correct more time is needed very good that is a problem okay but isn't something that longitudinal study provides that cross sectional study cannot provide what is that something okay what is what we need to learn here yeah? so cross sectional study provides as a snapshot of a given point in time at a given point how different children are responding to nutrition this is what we can answer with cross sectional study so what it provides is a snapshot okay a glimpse of what is happening at a given point of time but there may be many factors which are influencing it same people may not respond the same way the next year or the 2 year old may respond differently compared to the 4 year old you cannot answer that question with cross sectional studies because it only provides as a snapshot in a given point of time okay so those that actually change are vary over a time cannot be studied using cross sectional studies for that longitudinal studies are preferable but at the cost of what longitudinal studies you have to wait for another 2 years whatever time points maybe 6 months maybe weeks maybe years you have to wait till then okay so that is time taking and laborious and lot of organization and planning is required for that so it may not be preferable for many cases sometimes it is cross sectional studies which are preferred because easy one go you can get the data sometimes longitudinal studies where cross sectional studies cannot point out or cannot give you the answers that you are looking for then longitudinal studies are better i'll explain that with an example okay but for now just focus on the differences so cross sectional only provides us a snapshot of a given point in time at a societal level individual level you don't understand at society societal level or a population level you know okay how different age group children are impacted from protein diet you can answer those questions but you cannot answer how protein diet would influence a child over a period of time that you cannot answer before and after what happened before you take you took the sample you don't know after you took the sample what happens to the child you will not know right so that information is not provided by cross section studies but it gives a quick glimpse quick snapshot we need it so like that they both have their own advantages and disadvantages i'm going to give points on this i hope the concept is clear to you i'm going to give the advantages and disadvantages here let's first pick the longitudinal method so longitudinal method we are talking about a more specific method a more specific approach correct because you are you are observing the same subjects over a period of time okay so the time variation can be studied yeah 
<coughs> which is a very specific way of collecting data compared to the cross sectional study which can reveal various factors acting at different time so let's say the child who you studied at 2 years of age may not respond the same way at the fourth year the time variation can be analyzed using longitudinal method which is not possible with the cross sectional method okay and another yeah sorry if you didn't follow anything do let me know yeah can you repeat sir so advantage of longitudinal method is time course basically you are doing the time course here meaning you are observing those subjects or same sample sometimes over a period of time the benefit is anything that varies with the time can be understood here correct if like something that is influencing differently at the four, fourth year to the same person can be studied using longitudinal method but same time if you pick up another individual at the fourth fourth year may not give you that answer because that uh, dependency on some other factors may not be figured out may not be seen in that snapshot so you have to watch or observe that same person who is genetically different whose environment may be different so for that we need time course observation over a period of time okay and less number of subjects with this you can manage with less number of subjects one thing you see between longitudinal and cross sectional is cross sectional to get good amount of data we need to collect more samples we need more subjects same thing with the longitudinal methods you can manage with fewer subjects but more time samples can be obtained over a period of time like let's say you picked up only 10 children but you are observing them for 5 years let's say every year observing for 5 years so you get enough data points same with the cross sectional study what happens you cannot do that you cannot just manage with 10 children because the number of samples you have is statistically not significant what do you do you have to take 100 children 1000 children to get enough data and reliable data okay so you can manage with a less number of subjects in longitudinal method that is also an advantage and individual variations are taken care of let's say there is a variation maybe that person actually had some sort of disease or infection in the early childhood how do you compensate for it maybe there was a delay in his growth because he, he had mumps or measles some infection how do you account for the difference if you keep observing the same individual you get the rate of difference in the individual from time to time so individual variations can be taken care of if same thing let's say you are comparing two year old four year old and you are seeing the different impact but how do you include the aspect of infection that a person went through the four year old went through measles but two year old didn't wouldn't that impact it but you would not know it only through observation over a period of time you will understand the difference here so individual variations are accounted for in longitudinal method which is not the case with cross sectional method okay these are some advantages of longitudinal method what are the problems with longitudinal methods definitely more expensive time it takes time right it consumes lot of time so time more time means more money you have to require more planning more payments more processing if it has to be done multiple times at different time points so more time and more <coughs> investment <coughs> or cost more time and expensive another problem is managing the data you have to have this data maintained meticulously for over a period of time so let's say your project is running for 10 years you have to have data meticulously maintained like that data errors should be avoided the way you collected data in the second year and the fourth year if it is different the result will be different so maintaining the lab data collection of lab data is challenging for longitudinal studies because more long term commitments are needed okay next attrition of samples this is only holds true uh, let's say that you collected the same sample but you are observing it over a period of time the sample may undergo damage so this is not true for the subjects live subjects 
but any sample that you collected from a person let's say you want to see how tissues are actually growing in the laboratory after first year second year the sample may undergo damage attrition of the sample may happen here yeah? okay but this is this only holds true for having the same sample which is observed over a period of time not true for having the same subject which is alive will not have this problem next cannot be repeated let's say you realize that you made a mistake in the study what what do you need to do you made a mistake in the last time point that you collected you made a mistake how do you rectify that can you go back in time and repeat the experiment now what happens you have to redo the experiment A experiment has to be restarted so if you realize after one year two years you lose precious time so this is also a big problem with longitudinal method okay few points for advantages few points for disadvantages okay i'm going to talk to you or discuss with you uh, discuss uh, case study on this you will be able to understand this a bit better next what about cross sectional study in a way i compared it already with longitudinal study and explained you if not you know uh, look at these key points so cross sectional study compared to the longitudinal study is easy and quick one time experiment you have to collect many samples but one time experiment so easy and quick method expenses wise also comparatively cheaper compared to the longitudinal method it is more economic okay right so no attrition as with the longitudinal sample one time this experiment is done no problem with the attrition of the sample and what you can analyze here is the various factors acting at that given point of time so what you are analyzing is the in the given context in the given condition however the components are or subjects are behaving you are studying only that so it gives a snapshot in relevance with the the current conditions of that particular situation and let's say that you realized sorry i'll wait till you finish writing okay so various factors acting at that time can be analyzed and if something goes wrong with the experiment is it possible to repeat the experiment given that it's only one time study you can definitely repeat the experiment so it can be repeated so those that are disadvantages to the longitudinal methods or advantages to the cross sectional methods longitudinal was more expensive this is less expensive there you can experience attrition of sample here no attrition of sample okay and uh, longitudinal cannot be repeated cross sectional can be repeated so if you remember one the other ones are opposite to that okay what are the disadvantages so variability within the sample so once you have done the study but you don't know whether there is a you know problem or vari variation within that samples because you are comparing different individuals so there is variation genetic variation or upbringing nutritional variations you cannot account for because you are comparing different individuals and trying to come to a conclusion based on it correct so variability within the sample next larger size of the sample i i was telling you an advantage with the longitudinal was smaller sample but here you need more samples for better statistical data so large size of the sample is a disadvantage here next point factors acting at various time period cannot be analyzed only factors acting at that time point can be analyzed but we don't account for the the factors that probably act before or after the experiment that we cannot include so 
So this is a problem with the cross sectional method. So yes, the larger size of sample could be the advantage. No, it may provide the accuracy. Correct. It is advantage, but at the cost of what? You need to collect more samples that cost more money, more time, more work. So not easy to perform in that sense. Okay. Okay. In that sense, it is actually problem here. But you're right. If you have more larger sample, better result, better output. There's no doubt about that. More accuracy. Sir, can you explain variability within the sample again once? Right. Variability within the sample is like in a given experiment, for example, like what are you trying to answer? How protein diet can influence growth and development in, in different children? And let's say you have a two-year-old, four-year-old, six-year-old. There is a variability that you are experiencing within that. Two ways: one, variability within the between the samples, okay, to come to a conclusion, because you are assuming that uh, except for the protein diet, everything else is same, which you cannot, because you are comparing different samples there. So you are you are assuming that they are all same, which cannot be right. And if there is any variability that that actually introduced over a period of time or before the test and after the test, you are not accounting for it. So that point you miss it because you're only studying at that given point of time. You don't know what happens before or after. So that is also a limitation of this study. Conversely, in longitudinal uh, variability within a sample can be observed. Right. So what what does that mean? So depending on what you want to learn, what is acceptable for your study you choose whether cross sectional or longitudinal can we do something in between i think both can be done at the same time both right? can be done at the same time okay that is what is called a cohort sequential developmental study this is called there are multiple other methods are there but by looking at literature i picked up the most common one and i've been seeing in the exam they are asking specifically longitudinal method cross sectional method in the exam they are asking it specifically so that is why i definitely chose to discuss the longitudinal cross sectional in addition to that i wanted to talk to you about the cohort sequential study so meaning it's both together it's longitudinal plus cross sectional study this is mainly to address the weaknesses of the longitudinal cross sectional study so that we can have the advantages of both In this image, you can actually see it. The cohort comparison is where. Two thousand two, you look in. You studied eight year old. Two thousand four, you studied two thousand another eight year old. You can compare them. Okay, similarly, a ten year old from two thousand four and a ten year old from the two thousand six can be compared. Okay, you can actually add both the components. You do. You repeat the cohort study over a period of sorry. cross sectional study over a period of time in a way you perform the cross sectional study over a period of time so you take same subjects you repeat repeatedly observe them or collect their samples analyze their samples so you are performing both cross sectional and longitudinal together which is what is called cohort sequential study sir what did we longitudinal how is it longitudinal longitudinal we are taking the same set mm -hmm. longitudinal is same observation what do you do is look at do both of them let's say the example i told you 2 year 4 year old 6 year old this you took that is cross section study at one point correct you repeat the same thing at the fourth year sixth year so what are you doing at the fourth year you are taking again those samples again reobserving them So what do you get here? You get a cross-sectional component as well as longitudinal component. Correct. Longitudinal is where you don't you don't actually take number of those sections. You only observe the same child over a period of time. Here you you are taking those sections as well as you are observing them over a period of time. So both are happening. Correct. So in a way, as explained here, the researcher begins with two or more age groups, which is cross-sectional component of it. they collect more sections and follows each age group over a period of time which is a longitudinal component
so you are beginning with more groups and studying them over a period of time so we have both cross sectional part as well as longitudinal part in it okay so what does it provide this cohort sectional sequential study provides us the both the components of cross sectional as well as longitudinal both components are are possible here and also as i have shown in the image this cohort sequential study allows us to calculate the correlations between measures taken at two different time periods we see the correlation between two time periods like for example so we are able to compare two different time periods two 8 year olds you get the data how was a 8 year old in 2002 responded how is a 8 year old in 2004 responded you can also get that cross comparison and see if that holds true if doesn't hold true then you look for the reason why did it change okay right so these are the three methods that i want you to know but also be aware about the twin studies method that uh, related to it okay twin studies method along with the cross sectional longitudinal cohort sequential but in the exams most importantly they are asking about cross sectional and longitudinal methods straight forward question in the exam frequently comes in the exams so knowing cross sectional long in long detail method advantages disadvantages plus we look into a case study related to this so i, I picked up this case study from the research uh key related to india something that you can easily follow here the case study the title is world health organization growth standards for infants and young children what is the title of the case study who growth standards for infants and young children some case studies are mentioned in this slide before if you have, if you have noticed it british social attitude survey labor force survey so like these well known surveys in uk were performed using cross sectional method and similarly british birth cohort studies and understanding society had been done in longitudinal methods i wanted to pick something that is more common so i i came across a study where they are actually preparing um an average reference point for growth comparison growth chart comparison for children from any country developed country developing country so i felt this is universal has universal use so i picked up this example so this was published in 2009 as per the study so it's a decade old study so this is called wh was multi center growth reference study so what exactly they are planning to do here they are actually plan to perform growth reference study multi center growth reference study okay so they want to create a growth reference an average growth reference for comparing any child from any country so aim is that to study the growth of the healthy breastfed infants living in good hygiene conditions the objective of the study was to to conduct study on the growth aspect of healthy breastfed infants living in good hygiene conditions okay what do they mean here there there is one criteria for this the criteria is they are looking into uh, individual families where they are non smoking and they are breastfeeding their babies there are other components but key aspects are this good hygiene so meaning infections are not so common because that can disturb the growth aspects of them correct so they want good hygiene maintained in the families and they breastfed and non smoking families those families are selected for this 
So in the best case scenarios, basically, how would the growth look like? Okay, so, and this study was conducted between 1997 and 2003. So from where did they pick the families? Who are the subjects here? I told you that based on the conditions I mentioned to you, they picked up the families from various countries, six countries indeed. And the study was done between 1997 and 2003. So about six years and six countries. Okay, and what are those countries? Brazil, Ghana, India, Norway, Oman, and US. They wanted to have countries representing various different, uh, uh, you know, countries in the world. So they have range of countries, starting with the country like Ghana and India, Ghana and India in, in a category, and uh, developed countries like Norway, Brazil, Oman, and you developed a country like USA. So range of countries. So six countries, what are they? Brazil, Ghana, India, Norway, Oman, and US. Okay, how many samples have they connected? Now use the knowledge that you gained from our discussion on longitudinal and cross-sectional studies. Look at the numbers here. The problems and advantages, disadvantages we talked about. Right? Look at the numbers here. Longitudinal component, so meaning time course that they picked up. How did they do? They did follow up of 882 infants. They took 882 infants from birth to 24 months. So starting from the birth, as soon as they are born, to the 24 months. Like you see at the bottom, longitudinal study, what they have done? Okay, they visited their homes starting from the birth. At birth, they went to their home, collected samples. Week one, two, four, six, and monthly from every month from two months to 12 months. You don't have to write all these details. Just get the specific idea that they have to collect samples at different time points, that's it. Right? So starting from birth, first few weeks, then few months, then every two months till two years. Totally, for birth to 24 months, they collected data. Is it really laborious or not? Going to families, collecting data like that and maintaining data like this, is it not laborious for them? Is it not expensive for them? Right? So longitudinal study is done like that. Whereas in cross-sectional component, at one go, they took babies from 18 months to 71 months. They took babies from 18 months to 71 months. So almost four years in a way. six years, six years study. So they took six years, 71 months or six years, 18 to 71 months aged. So, but they took, look at the sample size, 6,669, approximately 6,670, 6670 children as opposed to 882. 882. So almost eight fold more samples to handle. At one go, handling about 6,500 samples or 700 samples is definitely challenging. More human errors will be introduced. Okay, and yeah, but they compared different age groups at one go. This is one time done. 18 months to six, six years approximately. So is it okay if we round off this number, say 882 to 900 and this to say probably 65? I think the concept, how you explain the concept is important. Then the, the examiner may not know exactly the study, right? The way you explain it is important. 
and show the importance of this study. It's a later, at a different point of time, you, you picked up, you saw other example that fits very well into this. You can give that example. How to present the case study and what elements are required is important here. So what is the study about? When was it conducted? What was the purpose of this study? How was it conducted? Given that we are studying the method here, you have to explain the method. Focus is how longitudinal study is done, how cross-sectional study is done. Both are done here. Okay, right. With this study, what did they come out with? What was the outcome of this study then? So the outcome of this study is the, the standards depict the normal human growth under optimal environmental conditions. Whatever standards they collected, they got a feeling for how children should grow. At what age? Doesn't matter whatever country you are from. By using representative data from about six countries, they created growth charts, which depict normal human growth under optimal environmental conditions. So a reference point is created. Indians can use it, Americans can use it, anyone can use it. Otherwise, most of these, most of the times, the growth charts we use belong to other countries than developed countries where such studies are done. So they may not exactly represent the average comparison. But whereas here, they created a good average. So the standard would definitely act to depict the normal human growth under optimal environmental conditions, irrespective of where the child is from. So this is an average picture. So it can be used to assess children everywhere, regardless of ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and type of feeding. Okay. So basically, of course, here, this is comparable for the breastfeeding babies. And if breast, they are not breastfed, the difference that they notice is because of the change in the diet. So they would understand that diet might have caused a problem. Like sometimes mothers do develop some bacterial infections. They do develop something called mastitis, mastitis infection. So bacterial infections to the mammary glands can happen. So in that condition, the mother cannot probably feed the baby. Or sometimes because of hormonal issues, mother may not be able to provide you know, breast milk to the child. So such conditions, what is the impact on the growth can also be seen here. So doctors can see what went wrong there with the child because they're comparing with this difference where babies were fed with the breast milk. Next, it allows the development of a truly international reference. So this will provide a true international reference, underscoring the fact that child populations grow similarly across the world's major regions. When health and care needs are met, doesn't matter whether they are in US or they are, they are in Mumbai or they are in Ghana, doesn't matter. If the basic needs, meaning their family environment, their nutrition, the hygienic conditions, if they are met, doesn't matter wherever. I think we all should have equal genetic potential or similar genetic potential. I don't say identical, but similar genetic potential we all should have. As per that, we should achieve the growth. So in the second point, it says uh, can be used to assess hmm. children under any type of feeding. Yes. So that is what I'm telling you. Yeah, uh, I think they can compare children with a different feeding and see what could have gone differently from the regular feeding. Reference point is breastfed. Some deviation from that, if it is noticed, that could be because of the feeding problem. That is, I was giving example. There are times, maybe situations where Maybe mothers cannot feed the children, maybe because of infections or other problems. But like we have club. HIV. Sorry? Yeah. But they have clubbed them with, say, regardless of ethnicity or socioeconomic status. Uh, so in case ethnicity, ethnicity is different, would that be used to compare? So, okay, I think I see the point here. What I'm trying to say here is, I think the, the use or, uh, or importance of that, what I see here is the, if even if they are not fed, breastfed, so the difference can be felt here. That is what the uh, use I can see here. But as such, you cannot compare the normal growth despite of the breastfeeding is not possible here. 
Okay. So I definitely see uh, the question that you are raising here. As is the children everywhere, regardless of ethnicity, is it like regardless of their breast feed, feeding? That may not be true here. So regardless of ethnicity, regardless of social economic condition, I think is different from type of feeding. That is what I feel. The the benefit of comparison here is whether the alternative form of feeding. I don't think there is any better alternative form of feeding than the breast feeding. Nothing is comparable to that. But for some uh, you know unavoidable reasons, if it happens, they can find out what caused the problem. That is the benefit I can see here by comparing with the reference point developed using breastfed babies. Okay, this is the outcome. So you can make a mention. This is a universal, like a useful study. So WHO uh, funded study. So okay, right. So did you understand the importance of longitudinal cross-sectional studies here? What are they? How are they conducted? What are the advantages and disadvantages with them? Okay, right. Right. So next, I'll briefly talk to you about the the next topic, which is. concept of aging aging and senescence we are going to briefly talk about aging and senescence i'm going to briefly go over those components so that tomorrow uh, i can go with the different uh, theories plus you know the concept of uh, somatotyping okay so today we are going to focus on aging and the concepts of biological aging and chronological aging right so what is aging to begin with let's understand in general what does it mean by aging so how do you define aging in your own terms so what does aging means to you cells lose their capacity to revive sort of that is the losing capacity to like to uh, function properly to to have a function to have a normal physiological function cellular function okay to lose that ability to perform activities normally let's say okay right so we see that in the form of various symptoms of aging right various signs of aging like loss of hair loss of ability to control things better skeletal functionality right memory all sorts of things correct this is something that we all experience so aging is the progressive accumulation of changes with time so aging refers to in general i'll provide you definitions on this for standard definitions but let's first make the general statements related to that so aging refers to the progressive accumulation process progressive accumulation progressive accumulation of changes with time progressive accumulation of changes with time associated with or responsible for the accumulation of changes over time associated with so what factors influence your increasing susceptibility to disease and death it's a progressive accumulation of changes with time so changes to what changes to physiological aspects i know changes to tissues body components or even cellular components parts of our cell they all can undergo changes at different levels okay i'm going to briefly explain that to you okay but many of these things we we actually have increased susceptibility over a period of time as we age as we advance in age susceptibility to disease and death also increases correct so what happens is progressive accumulation of changes put us at higher risk for death and higher risk for 
or higher susceptibility to disease. That is the concept of age or aging. Okay. So what happens because of aging, normal physiological functions decline. As I was telling you, our physiological function or capacity decreases or it declines, especially as we age, which is more evident in the middle to late adulthood and especially as, uh, for sure in the elderly ages. So starting from the middle adulthood to the late adulthood, this, this can be evident graying of the hair, which is a common theme, loss of teeth and thinning of hair. Okay, I'll show you some examples. These are the signs that we normally see because of the aging process. Okay, I'll provide you some terms here, some terminology I want you to be aware about. So gerontology, gerontology is a branch of science that studies the aging process. Gerontology is a science of aging. Gerontology is science of aging. Okay, so what was the signs of growth and development? Do you remember that we discussed today? Oxo Oxology, 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 Gerontology. Okay, so senescence, we're going to talk a bit more in detail about senescence. Senescence can be considered as a process of aging. So at the level of cell, what happens to us indicating or showing the signs of aging is probably called the senescence process. So senescence is the process happening at the cellular level or at the organism level leading to aging. So senescence can be seen as the process behind aging. It can be considered as the process behind aging. Okay. Next, these things you know very well, lifespan versus life expectancy. What is the difference between them? Lifespan refers to the longest time that someone can live, a species can live, like about 100 years or about 110 years. The lifespan is that. Normally we say humans have 100 years of lifespan because we know that the maximum time that humans have ever lived is about 100. But there are rarest of rare cases, 110, 112, 120 years, you probably have seen or heard about. And life expectancy means? Average years. Average years. Average time. Average life expectancy. I think uh, I was briefly showing you this. I'm not sure if I pointed out that or not. But the document I shared with you on uh, statewide disease burden report, they have clearly shown that life expectancy in India is increasing. Okay. Especially in some states like Kerala, the life expectancy went over 70 years. So this is an average time that a given species 
expected to live about 70 to 76 years is common for humans on average okay also i want you to make a note of this word called teratogens 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 i think in one of the document uh, i was shared with you has this term in it teratogens this one helen so teratogens what are teratogens substances that cause birth defects so basically these are toxins when our body is exposed to them especially in initial stages it impact the growth negatively substances that cause birth defects or other abnormalities in the developing embryo or fetus are called teratogens substances are toxins alcohol can be seen as a teratogen or some drugs can be seen as teratogens Excuse me, human alcohol can be a teratogen, an example of teratogen. So toxins which negatively impact our growth in mother's womb. Okay. So let's see the formal definition of these terms and also I think we already looked into this slide already right once I showed you the slide. Senescence refers to what because sometimes if you are asked to write about senescence and aging you should be able to write some information on it. So I'm going to discuss together for both senescence and aging. I'm going to give definitions for both senescence and aging. I was telling you briefly senescence is a process behind in behind aging. It is considered to be the process behind aging where in senescence cell loses ability to divide, grow and function. Some cells cannot divide. They say they are senescent. Sometimes temporarily they are not able to divide. In general sense, we may use the word senescent. So they cease to grow. They cease to divide. Some cells are like that. But in general, almost all the tissues may experience senescence at one point of time eventually they lose function. So this is the process by which a cell loses its ability to divide, grow and function. Mainly, it will not divide. If it doesn't divide, no growth. Okay, right. So let's look at the definitions for aging and senescence. So this is given by a couple of the definitions here. Maynard Smith in 1962. So some of the components we already discussed that aging processes are those which render individuals more susceptible as they grow older to various factors, either they are intrinsic factors or extrinsic factor, resulting in death. More or less talking about the exact points that we discussed already, right? So just make a note of this. As per Maynard Smith, 1962, aging is defined as so and so. Okay, Maynard Smith is uh, interested in his mathematician as well as evolutionary biologist. Mathematician, so British biologist. 
British mathematician, British biologist, and geneticist. Okay, as per him. Student of famous geneticist called Halden, Halden Muller, probably heard about. He's a student of him. Okay, so next definition is given by Comfort, 1960. He's also a biologist. Okay, as per him, uh, aging is an increased liability to die or increasing loss of vigor. So increasing loss of strength and uh, with age, we become more and more liable to die. So we are moving in the direction of death in a way. With increasing chronological age, uh, as we age in numbers, with the passage of the life cycle. So as we move on, as we grow, as we add our lives, as we add years to our life, we tend to die. This is what he talks about. So he is looking into the aspects of the process that make us liable to die, which decrease the strength or vigor. Okay. Next definition for senescence. So Stretchler definition of senescence is the changes which occur generally in the post-reproductive period. Senescence is the changes which occur generally in the post-reproductive period. So meaning this process may not begin very early on, but maybe later point of time. So mostly after the reproductive period and result in decreased survival capacity. Decreased survival capacity on the part of the individual organism. It may sound the same to you, right? Both aging and this, but senescence is a process that leads to the aging. So, and which becomes more and more evident at later points of our life. So that is why they're saying that senescence are the changes that happen generally after post-reproductive period, resulting in decreased survival capacity of the individual organism. Eventually this results in or leads to aging process. Correct? So in a way, senescence is that, but both are related as you see here. Both may not, may not more or less sound similar to us. But one is cellular process, another one is the overall change in body's capacity to function. Okay.
Right. These are the formal definitions to the aging and senescence. Okay, right. There are a few other things I would like to briefly tell you here as a connection between senescence and the aging process. So senescence is the, the process where, as we talked about, that cell loses its ability to divide. Correct? What are those processes that trigger the concept of senescence? What are the triggers for senescence? Triggers for senescence can be multiple. As you see in the image here, make a note of them. The triggers, what triggers senescence? What triggers a cell to not divide? Multiple examples, multiple factors are there. Some well-known factors are these. Telomere dysfunction. Telomere dysfunction. What are telomeres? Ends of chromosomes, right? Telomeres are the ends of chromosomes. So telomere dysfunction. And another one is the Oncogenes, cancers, tumor formation or cancers. So when cells actually undergo this cancerous growth, what happens? Senescence happens because we don't want cells to multiply when they're cancerous, when they can spread the cancer to us. So it is seen as a mechanism that is useful to us in some conditions. So activated oncogenes would trigger senescence. Then DNA replication stress or DNA damage. Damage in our DNA, damage to DNA. Those cells which carry damaged DNA, there is a mechanism for them to die. So they may begin, they may trigger the process of senescence because we don't want damaged DNA. Damaged DNA can further trouble our body. So we don't want damaged cells with damaged DNA to survive. Okay. Similarly, you can write one more example that is oxidative stress. So triggers are like this, telomere dysfunction, activation of oncogenes or cancer causing genes, DNA damage and oxidative stress. I'll tell you in one theory, I'll explain what is oxidative stress for now, just make a note of it. I'll explain what does it mean later in tomorrow's class. So the benefit of these process, benef benefit of these triggers is some, in one way you can look at the short term benefits. If activated oncogenes, you know, would result in this, we are able to suppress, tumor suppression can happen. We are not letting the cells with the cancerous growth to survive. So short term benefit of senescence is tumor suppression. And short term benefit is to limit the tissue damage because further tissue damage you can prevent. If you stop the damage of that at one point of time, tissues may not damage completely because they keep multiplying the damaged DNA. So in a way you can prevent that process. So there are some short term benefits. Even they say that embryonic, in the process of embryonic development is also senescence related to few cells is useful in controlling the aspect of embryonic development, few cells have to lose their ability to control other cells. So even in embryonic development, senescence seems to play an important role. But otherwise, something that you can easily relate here is tumor suppression, limiting the tissue damage. So these are some short term benefits. Same thing in the long term, The senescence would result in the concept of tumor growth as well. If this long term, if certain cells are damaged like that, certain ability to control or regulate the excuse me, DNA may be lost, resulting in cancer formation in long term and also aging. Aging could also be the result of 
such a process. So short term benefits are there at the same time in long term, it results in the aging process. This is what I wanted to show you as a connection to senescence. So here, what did we learn? What triggers the senescence process? What are the short term benefits of senescence? What are the long term outcomes of the senescence process? And the key aspect we are focusing here is aging. In long term, senescence results in aging because our body cannot repair the tissues, damaged tissues. They cannot add new tissues. They cannot add new hair, new muscles. So what happens? We eventually lose the ability to survive. Okay, right. So this is what the connection between the senescence and the aging process. Briefly. So if you want to make a note of this statement that I picked up from an online article, that why we need, what is the purpose of senescence, which you probably would un understood it already. So senescence is an irreversible form of long-term cell cycle arrest or cell cycle, cell division ability is last I talked to you about in response to different stress factors or triggers I mentioned to you. The purpose of the cell cycle arrest is to limit the proliferation of damaged cells. So a short-term advantage I told you is it, it avoids or further damage to the tissues is prevented. It limits the proliferation of the damaged cells, eliminate the accumulated harmful factors. So DNA damage can accumulate, more and more cells can carry damaged DNA. So the accumulated harmful factors can be minimized. So that we can disable the potential cancerous growth. So that we can disable the potential cancerous growth. Okay, right. So we'll stop the session here. In tomorrow's class, I'm going to discuss what are the features of aging. I'm going to discuss briefly with you various features of aging, what happens during the aging process. So what would you write more on a short note of aging? Okay, like what causes aging and senescence connection and various features of aging, more than what we normally discuss, some aspects of it. Plus, I'm going to talk to you about the theories explaining aging. Okay, so tomorrow we'll continue from the aging features. Okay, the biological concept of aging. And we're going to talk about what physiological changes happen in us. And we'll also discuss about the concept of biological versus chronological aging. Okay, and theories, theories of aging. So hopefully we'll finish these components tomorrow and we'll be left with somatotyping. I think that will take a bit more time, but I'll hope to finish half of the somatotyping in tomorrow's class so that we can, sorry. Okay, right. Any questions guys before we end the session for today? Give it a read, give the uh, the specific contents that I was mentioning to you. Give it a read. So, is it okay if I go with the, uh, I'm not, I've not checked it. Have you guys written the test? How many of you have submitted the test? I've not checked it. But as we discussed, you know, if you have not written it, would you plan to do that soon so that we can plan another test so that we can catch up the tests, okay? But I'll give you a little bit of relaxation, few days time, because I'm not going to correct them before uh, Thursday or Friday. So you can submit uh, the test till th by Thursday, but I think it's not overlap with your other preparations, right? And eventually I would like to start the, or uh, give you the next test. So where ecological, epidemiological anthropology that we are going to focus on. Ecological, epidemiological anthropology. Sure, sir. Okay, right there, sir. Have a good idea. Thank you, sir. You too. Hope you are not still stuck in the car.
I'm, I'm still in the car. I have to drive. Oh, yeah. oh, you have to drive. Yes, sir, I have to drive. Because I, I came to hospital for some work. Hmm. I didn't finish because I had to meet someone who was delayed the whole process. So, supposed to get the work done by afternoon, but didn't happen. So, I just sat down nearby a parking lot. So, finishing the teaching and then now I go home. I have to drive for another one and a half hour to reach home. Oh. Okay, but that's all right. <laughs> we'll catch up the work. Okay, sir. Thank Bye. you for your time. No, no issues, man. Bye. Bye, guys.